Hey, healthcare workers. Today's episode is dedicated to you. So stay tuned if you want to find out more about how to deal with the crisis and the stress that you're experiencing these days. Welcome back. So today I wanted to talk about some of the things that um, some of the frontline workers have been experiencing. So most specifically, I wanted to talk about what healthcare workers are experiencing. Um, so really and truly, it's like, what is what does what does a body look like and what does it go through when we're working in crisis? Um, so one area of my research, actually, when I was doing my master's was to look at um, how stress affects the body um, from the first responder perspective. So when I was coming across my research, I came across this guy named Dr. Gilmartin, and he has worked primarily primarily with law enforcement um, and around the idea of physical safety. So the biggest thing is, is that he talks about this term called hypervigilance. Now, we've all heard of hypervigilance before, but we haven't maybe thought about it in this context. Basically, what it is, is it's prolonged exposure to stress that is rooted in a biologically driven perspective of heightened awareness of a threat to one's safety. So if you think about this, we've got healthcare workers who are working in um, hospital environments with, a, with prolonged stress and a lot of physical safety issues around you know, can I get sick? Is this something that will happen to me? And they're working in this environment day in, day out. So here's the thing. In contrast to what the general public is going through, they're, you know, not necessarily experiencing the same level of physical safety problems as those who would be, you know, frontline workers and are are in it. So this is very similar to what a cop experiences or police officer experiences on a day-to-day basis. Now, in no way am I saying that, um, you know, our law enforcement sector um, doesn't do amazing work. Absolutely they do. But we can learn something from some of the things that they go through in terms of hypervigilance and their emotional survival in order for us to know how to help our frontline workers in hospitals right now. So the big thing around uh, what happens to us is there's a bunch of bodily systems that are involved. Uh, One of them is called the reticular activating system. Now, the reticular activator is basically the thing that helps us pick out what's a threat to us. So that's really where our heightened awareness comes from. And we're hardwired to be able to pick out the things in our environment that are gonna prevent us from actually getting hurt in some sort of way. So that's why our awareness is really, really helpful for us. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that the reticular activator is also what increases the amount of stress that we're feeling in a particular moment. So what it does is it activates our autonomic nervous system. So we've heard this word, this this terminology kind of thrown around a bit. This is the same as our fight or flight response. So fight or flight, what happens when we go into this this um, this state where we want to fight something off or want to run away from it, is that we get increased blood pressure, we have increased respiration, our body temperature increases, um, and then we get our body gets dumped with all these different chemicals and hormones. For example, adrenaline um, and cortisol, and those chemicals help us to Um, activate and get into a state where we can run away or fight something off. So what's important about this information is that there's the other side of the situation, which is that we also want to be able to, if we're going to be in these environments all the time, we also want to dial things back by using um, what would they call the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the other side. That's the part that brings us back down and helps us relax. But We have control over that system. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that right now, but later on, and indefinitely in another video, we're gonna talk about that in more detail. So the main thing to remember though, is that you can activate your parasympathetic nervous system to bring down that response that you get to the fight or flight. So let's talk about what happens when hypervigilance pops up. So when hypervigilance, Um, is activated. There's a bunch of things that happen physically to our bodies because we're using all of these resources from our bodies at a particular time. So one of them is that we might get increased peripheral vision, we might get improved hearing, um, our reaction time gets better, um, our heart rate increases, and we go through a lot more uh, blood sugar uh, consumption. And so what happens is your body just basically takes up a lot of energy in those moments. And so we get this energy burst. So we kind of have like maybe a kind of a feeling of being invincible. And a lot of people will feel that way when they're at work, Uh, say they're a nurse or they're working in a hospital, you're busy, busy, busy running around. um, 
and that helps us perform better um, in the short term. So, but here's the part, this is where it gets really interesting though. The reality is, is that that will help us short in the short term, but realistically, there's this area that we're supposed to operate within. It's kind of um, an area of a normal range of risk for hypervigilance. And we wanna operate within this little band of time and space um, without kind of going through the extremes because what ends up happening is every time we go outside that range of risk, we might have um, a lot of time where we're really on, but then it moves back down to the bottom and we end up having a lot of like other symptoms when we're not on duty. So what ends up happening is, is we end up with um, a tired, detached, isolated, apathetic feeling when we dip back down and we're no longer working. So here's what's really scary about this actually, is that anybody who works, say like a 12 hour shift or a work day, they actually need a good 24 hours to recover from that feeling of hypervigilance after they work. And the reality is, is that we go home, we work eight hours and we get home and we go back to work again. So nobody actually gets the opportunity to recover fully from this state of hypervigilance which is part of the reason why we end up having a harder time in the long run. I think we all kind of know what it feels like to have a very busy day and then to get home and to kind of like fling ourselves into bed at the end of the day. Some nurses have described maybe like not being able to even cook their own meal before they fall asleep. Um, but really and truly what ends up happening is, is it's a coping mechanism that we've all seen. And Dr. Gilmartin refers to it in his research as the magic chair. So he says that physically exhausted officers crash upon returning home with withdrawal into themselves to the exclusion of their family, loved ones, and friends. Um, and so what's interesting is, is that there's actually a reason for this. The reason is, is because we don't have any more resources to give anyone when we come home after we've been giving them to other people all day long and to try and stay in that state of hypervigilance. So what ends up happening is, is that magic chair, I mean, I think, you know, I think about like, you know, after you've gone through the things you've gone through in a day, you don't have any more to give in terms of telling people how your day was or what was going, going on. You don't have anything else left to, to try and connect with any of your loved ones. Um, and this is because your energy stores have depleted because of hypervigilance. So realistically, hypervigilance is a cyclical biologically driven energy change that continues to happen over and over and over again, unless we figure out a way to uh, change the way this cycle works. So with hypervigilance being this cyclical thing that happens, um, a bunch of other things start to happen as well. And these are um, bio like biological conditions um, that are mistakenly interpreted to be a mental state. Um, but really what happens is it starts to kind of form like a cascade that starts to interrupt different parts of our lives. So examples can be avoidance of that negative state by staying alert all the time, maybe trying to work longer or for as long as possible. Um, sometimes that ends up being something that ends up being a problem for your family because then you're feeling like you want to stay in that that space and then eventually you know, your role within your family starts to uh, deteriorate because they're missing their loved one. Um, but there are other symptoms. Behaviors associated with hypervigilance can include things like the desire to remain socially isolated at home, an unwillingness to engage in conversations or activities that are not related to your um, what you're doing. Because you also feel like nobody understands what it is that you're going through, but you also don't have the energy to try and explain it to anybody. Um, so that's part of the catch-22 there reduced interaction with uh, non-work friends and acquaintances, again, for the same reason. Procrastination and decision, decision making not related to work. Um, and this is also because you have to make decisions so much, so rapidly throughout the day, you don't wanna do it when you get home. Um, Non-involvement in children's activities and needs. Sometimes we just feel like we don't have those things to give them. Um, and then this idea of the I used to syndrome. So this is one of those things I would pay attention to. The longer this COVID thing goes on for is, um, or even just if you're experiencing burnout in general, um, the I used to syndrome, I used to syndrome is a loss of interest in hobbies 
and or recreational activities. So I used to be involved in blah, blah, blah. These are things that I used to do um, in my time. Um, so those are some of the behavioral changes that you start to see. Um, so the other thing that you start to see is that they kind of, a person who's experiencing this kind of um, the effects of hypervigilance, they start to kind of like uh, distance themselves from other things. Uh, because they start to feel like there's a lack of control. And this happens usually over a longer period of time. So what we have to watch for with COVID is that these things don't start popping up the longer these healthcare workers are working in these environments. So some of the things that start to happen are you start to feel li like you have limited control over um, things that are going on within the hospital setting, um, what's happening with politicians, what's happening with your bosses, you know, all of those kinds of things. And it starts to feel more out of control and you start to feel that you see yourself more as a victim because you feel like you can't control the things that you want to be able to. So limited control can also lead to one to acquire almost like an entitlement mindset that justify that is justified by feeling screwed by the people, screwed by the people that are the powers that be. Um, and when we start to feel this feeling, it's completely legitimate that you would feel that way because so many things have come down the pipe so many changes have been made, so many things you've had to think about in terms of keeping yourself safe, that of course you feel like you don't have any say in how those things happen to you. And there's nothing else we can do but go to this place within ourselves where we feel like we're being screwed. Um, and with this whole um, feeling around victimization that comes out of this approach, it then turns into things like uh, merging professional and personal roles, being having a harder time being able to see the, that, that there's a clear distinction between those roles, um, hypersensitivity to change because we don't need any more change when we don't have control of anything, um, rigidity and inflexibility, um, an ever-present feeling of being threatened or persecuted, need to retaliate against the power structure. Um, and you might start to see some of these changes happen within your organization. Um, but this is also an indication then that if you're seeing yourself or your coworkers feeling this way, then that means that you're approaching burnout and there's some things that we need to do to kind of, to try and combat that. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you like what you see, please subscribe. Um, and I would love to hear from you in the comments below. Um, you can also reach out to me on um, email at video at sarahghorsford.com or you can find out more about me on my website www.sarahghorsford.com uh, for now please take care of yourself and each other